record. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, start technical session number two, introduction to computers. Uh, though throughout this course, you may see the technical sessions not necessarily go in order. We are trying to match up the order of the technical sessions that we're going to be going through to also merit, you know, to match up with Coursera. And we've also tried to match up test that as well. So sometimes you may see the courses jump around a little bit. Uh, but for the introduction to computers, we're going to kind of get into some basic terminology, uh, different types of computers, uh, inputs and outputs, safety measures that you should take whenever you're working on computers, and just kind of getting some basic information and terminology out there so that, you know, we'll be using a lot of this throughout the remainder of the course. And by the end of this, we should be able to describe in a basic sense how computers work, uh, including the relationships between hardware and software, and go ahead and throw firmware in there as well. And also explain the key safety precautions to take and tools, common tools you will see and use as a IT technician, both you know, in your personal life and as well on the job. The behavior skills and mindsets that we are going to be employing typically when we're working with technology and we are trying to learn and develop and grow, we're going to definitely employ a growth mindset and also adaptability because almost every computer you open up will be a little different, but the basic components tend to be the same, but locations and types will change. So. First, we have a basic definition of a computer, which is an electronic device for storing and processing data according to the instructions given to it in a variable program. Uh, initially, computers were just actually people who did mathematic computations. And over time, they found a mechanical means of doing this, and they started developing some of the most simple, you know, some of the first very simple computers. And gradually found more and more uses for them as our understanding of how to use this technology has grown and become more and more commonplace in people's homes and people's lives. I mean, you think about back in the mid to late 80s, it was kind of rare to even have computers commonly used in companies unless you were a rather specialized company back in on the railroads and stuff like that, they used what was called T cards, which was basically just a log that you would move around from folder to folder. And they didn't use computers at all. Everything was handwritten and detailed in that manner. And then over time, someone found a way to actually utilize database systems and start using that. And a lot of your heavier, you know, heavier computations needed computers that took up entire rooms. They were massive. And then you fast forward, what, just about 30 years or so, and we essentially have what would have been considered then a supercomputer in our pockets, and we carry that around with us every day. So in a very, very short span of time, technology has accelerated at an amazing rate. And I think it is Moore's law that every 18 months, uh, technological speed, the speed of processors doubled which when you think about it is crazy because it's, it's such a, a hard thing to maintain over a period of time to double speed every 18 months, but we've actually been able to maintain it for at least 30 years. Different types of computers, let's see. Will, can you please read for us? Yes, so uh, types of computers. Supercomputer, fastest, too big for personal use as requires a facility to house, mainly used by the science community. Example, car manufacturing. The second one is mainframe. Mainframe have lots of storage space, lots of input, output devices that can connect across vast distances. Example, servers. Third one, mini computer, 
faster than a microcomputer, holds more storage and has access to more input output devices. Example, point of sale machines, point of sale machines all connecting to one central computer. Microcomputer called micro because of the chip being small and, and affordable, first made by IBM and first to combine productivity with games. Example, personal computer. Excellent, thank you. Another name you might see for a mini computer will be a workstation. And they will typically use that term rather than a mini computer. Uh, can somebody think of another pretty famous example of a supercomputer that you hear about quite often? They've used it to, they've attempted to use it to create its own songs create its own recipes just from scratch, not anything input. It's using artificial intelligence to do this. Run by IBM. Big Blue. It's one of the biggest, it's one of the big supercomputers that they have. It's called Big Blue, it's run by IBM. And it's been able to do a lot of amazing things like creating its own music and uh, writes. I think actually at one point it started trying to write its own novels and they, I believe they used Big Blue to beat the world champion of Go, which is with the black and white stones. It's a Chinese uh, game that is uh, significantly more complicated than chess. Uh, another name for the game is called Othello. And uh, that was the one thing that they could not get computers to really do was to be creative enough to actually beat somebody who was a master at that game. And they just recently did it, I believe in 2017. And that was a real big, uh, real big day in the, in the artificial intelligence community. All right, computing parts basically broken down into three basic categories. You have hardware, which as we were discussing yesterday, these are the physical components that you can actually touch. Your keyboard, your monitor, your mouse, CPU, RAM, RAM blades, uh, discs, webcams, things like that. Though That would be considered your hardware. It's the things that you will physically need to connect to the computer to have it operate. And then you have software, which is programs, applications, and things like that that you would install onto the computer after all the hardware is in place. And then somewhere between there, you have what's called firmware, which is an actual chip that already has software stored on it. And it's typically your BIOS chip and your ROM chip. It is a very basic set of instructions, basically telling the computer, when you first click that power on, check, check for certain things to make sure everything's working okay, and then tells the computer, hey, here's where you go to look for your operating system. And here's the components that you have connected that you're allowed to use. And then it kind of gets everything kicked off so that your system can uh, run properly. And though it is read-only uh, memory, historically speaking, that was you could not alter or change or update that memory. Nowadays, you actually can update that memory. And you can run uh, firmware updates on a on your computers and stuff like that. And most people in IT will tell you that is one of the scariest times you're operating on a computer, because if anything happens during the time that you're you're updating your BIOS or flashing your BIOS, if anything happens, any kind of power disruption or it freezes up or anything like that, the device basically becomes a paperweight. It is now useless. So you will see IT people tend to go through pretty extraordinary measures to make sure that there is zero chance of a power outage. They'll use an uninterruptible power supply plugged in, and then sometimes they'll even hook it up to a secondary uh, power supply connected to a different breaker just to make sure that it does not lose power when they're trying to do it, especially on extremely important systems like servers and things like that, because you don't want to replace highly expensive pieces of machinery. Also, if they have a lot of valuable information like customer data stored on it, you don't want to lose all that data. So they take a lot of measures to make sure that there is no interruptions during the time that they're flashing the BIOS. So just quick, you know, quick reiteration, 
hardware, physical parts, monitors, keyboards, towers, CPU, physical things that you can actually touch. Software are the programs and stuff that run on the computer and operate the hardware. And then firmware is kind of in the middle and it is just basically a hardware chip with software stored on it like your BIOS chip or uh, ROM storage. Any questions or comments so far on that? Oh. All right. Here's some basic examples of hardware, uh, basically commuter components, your tower, optical drives, your HDD drives, power supplies, network cards, and other peripherals all fall under that hardware category. Firmware, uh, as we were discussing, gives you the startup instructions for low level hardware, kind of just telling the computer where to go look for all these things that it needs to be able to function as, you know, to its fullest potential. Because a lot of times you may not necessarily be operating off of your hard disk for your operating system. Sometimes you might be operating off of a USB drive. Sometimes it may be off of an optical drive and your computer is gonna need to know where to go look for these things whenever it boots up. Uh, firmware is typically attached to the motherboard, usually soldered on and does not change readily. It requires special utility, which is what we were saying is called flashing the BIOS or running a firmware update on that chip. And the data is stored on the actual physical ROM chips. Software, you have two basic kinds. You have your operating systems and then your applications and programs that run on top of your operating systems. <clears throat> See who knows to read out. Amber, can you please read out for us on this one? Operating systems, um, user interface to control the hardware, manages communication with software, runs applications, controls input and output, and examples are Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Applications and programs perform useful human tasks, run on top of an operating system, are written for a specific OS, example, Microsoft Office, Apple at Work, and Games. Excellent, thank you. So for the most part, the operating system is the main thing you see when you turn on the computer, and you have your background and all your applications behind it is the main thing you're operating off of on your phone, your computer, or what have you. And then the applications operate within this, the ecosphere of the operating system and are ten, tend to be much smaller programs and, and are generally set up to perform specific tasks, be it run a game, be it uh, spreadsheets or maps on your phone or something along those lines. Language of computers, uh, the lowest level language that computers listen to. I mean, for the most part, you type, you know, when you're typing in something on the computer, it doesn't understand that. So it actually has to be translated into a language that the computer can actually understand because computers only understand ones and zeros, which is kind of like a light switch. It's on if it's a one, off is if it's a zero. So it's literally just a switch going on and off in certain patterns and then the computer reads that as being an output like a word processor or something along those lines. And everything is broken down into two base math, which two base math basically means just every single time you're doubling it. So you would have, you know, one, two, four, eight, uh, 16, 24, or 32, excuse me. And each time you're doubling it. So that's, the entire architecture of the system is based off of doubling each time. So each switch is a doubling of the previous number. And then it's broken down into each one or zero, a single one or a zero is considered a bit. It is the smallest unit to which a computer can read. So a one or a zero is considered a bit. And typically it is clustered in what are called bytes. So a byte is eight individual bits that are strung together. And 
for the purposes of hexadecimals, which we will get into a little bit later, half of a bit, which is, or half of a byte, which is four bits, is called a nibble. So you have four ones or zeros clustered together would be called a nibble. Eight is a byte and a single one is a bit. And then a kilobyte is 1,024 bits. And then as you start scaling up, each megabyte is 1,024 kilobytes. And then each gigabyte is 1,024 megabytes. So can anybody tell me right off the top of your head, why not just say 1,000? Why is it 1,024? Any ideas? Go ahead, Emmanuel. Um, believe it's because it's a base base two rather than base ten. Correct, because as you're doubling it each time, it doesn't end on one thousand; it'll end on one thousand twenty-four. So, ex excellent. I appreciate it. For the, and this is this is going to be one of those points where, for the purposes of the exam, versus for the purposes, you know, in the wild, where we're going to deviate here a little bit. Uh, there's the Amer American Standard Code for Information Interchange, which is basically what they program into the computer, how it understands as each series of bits or each byte will correlate to a number, a letter, a symbol, or something along those lines. Well, the standard that we've been operating off of for quite some time is the ASCII. Well, recently, they've now changed it over to what is called, what is it, the UTP, or excuse me, UTF-8 and UTF-16. And the reason for that is, is the ASCII only allows for 128 different characters, which seems like a lot, but when you start getting into zero through nine, the entire alphabet, uppercase, lowercase, and then, you know, question functions where you have like question marks, explanation points and all that fun stuff, it starts eating that up pretty quickly. And then we start getting into math symbols and now emojis and all this other stuff has now become a part of our language on a pretty regular basis. And they're needing the computers to be able to recognize this in a much more efficient manner. So they've actually updated it to the UTF-8, which is what you will see more in the wild, but for the purposes of the exam, they're still operating off of the ASCII. I believe we have an example of that next. If not, I will show it. Here we go. Here's an example of the ASCII, and it kind of shows you what the decimals look like and how it kind of breaks things down versus decimal, hex, and characters based on the binary code that they're going to be putting in. You don't need to memorize this. This is just an example. So, but you will get into binary a little bit. And then if you decide to continue on into uh, network and stuff like that, you will need to be able to translate it at least into IP addresses and things like that, where they will give you a string of binary. You'll need to break it down into an IP address and then be able to reverse it as well, which it actually is not that complicated. So, but we will get into that a little bit more when we start getting into introduction to networking. All right, basic computer processes, and this is pretty much standard for almost every computer pro process that you have. First, the data, data comes in through some sort of input device, could be a touchscreen, keyboard, scanner, what have you, webcam, and it is sent straight into the computer's memory. And then the computer, the CPU, the CPU then processes this data based on the input, tries to figure out what it is and what applications are running that this is applicable to, and then it installs this in, you know, in the memory. When the CPU is finished processing data, it is then given back through an output device 
So your camera is taking it in, it's going through the CPU, CPU is processing it, and then it comes up on the screen and you see yourself on the screen. It's processing all that data, taking it in as an image, breaking it down into tiny bits, uh, ones or zeros, and then processing that through the CPU so you can see the output. And it's doing this in microseconds. And then we can also utilize that information so that it can be stored on a computer. All right, real quick, I'm gonna stop here. And on Nearpod, I'm going to pause the recording. Recording. Okay. All right, now we're just looking at basic inputs. Like you have your NIC card. Does anybody know what a NIC card is off the top of their head? Network interface card. Very good. Network interface card. I'm not seeing okay. that for years. You what? I'm not seeing the acronym NIC for years. <laughs> hey, they still use it. It's still used. Um, modem is an outdated term too. You don't typically, uh, it's not actually accurate anymore because it, it actually speaks more to telephone lines, modulator, demodulator. It really isn't accurate nowadays, but it is still something that is considered a colloquial term that everybody understands when you, you mention what it is. So, but actual technical term, the network interface card or NIC is still widely used in the industry and considered the correct term when you're speaking for the device used to connect your computer to the internet. Is this, now, uh, Kevin, I have a question. Okay. Is Go it ahead. the same as a network adapter? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Now, for the purposes of the exam, uh, especially those with IT experience and or background, you do need to keep this in mind when you are taking the exam. Do not try to look for the exception that disproves the rule. Because in a lot of these things, you might be able to find things that disprove the general rule that they're speaking for in the exam. But you don't necessarily want to go that way. That's not how they're viewing it. They're looking for mostly general terms. Like as for input devices, and they could also, some of these devices can also be considered output devices. And one that people don't often think of would be a keyboard. Keyboard can also be an output device. We do have keyboards now, like I think that have, will have little LCD screens on them that you can see um, an output on it. Also for quite some time, they've actually had keyboard for the visually impaired that would have a braille uh, row across the top and they could actually read the digital output on a screen in braille. So yes, it can technically be a output. It is a very, very specific type of device, but for the turn, you know, for the purposes of this, they considered almost strictly an input device. So other things, um, a mouse, I've seen uh, three-dimensional mice that could also be an output device. Again, for the purposes of this, it's considered strictly an input. Drives can go both ways. Scanners, they're an input. Digital cameras, input. Modem can do both. Microphone in only, and then NICs in only. Can anybody think of any other inputs that are not on here that you could possibly use? Camera? Oh, wait, that's already on there. We have a digital camera, yeah. Touch screen, maybe. There you go, touch screen. So that's another one that um, you'll see. They'll typically have it as an output unless it is specifically mentioned as a touch screen. Then it would be both for the purposes of the exam. But if it is just specifically mentioned as a monitor, that is output only. Uh, USB? USB, that could be an input, yeah. But that, that also might fall under drives. Um, something is called a digitizer. Where it's like a pad you can kind of draw on. That would be an input. Can anybody think of anything else? A controller, like a game controller. There you go, game controller. That's a perfect one. 
I like it. Signature pad. A what? Signature pad. Signature pad, pad. Signature. Oh, signature pad. Yes, yes. Um, that would be um, a type of touchscreen. Mm. Uh, like an USB inter is an interface. Yep, it is an interface standard. How about Bluetooth? Like Bluetooth enabled devices. Yes, well, that would be that would be definitely a method of inputting. But good, I like it. All right. Processing, the CPU, RAM, drives, motherboard. Those are the main components used for processing. Uh, one bit of terminology that is gonna be kind of hard because of its colloquial use versus its actual use in IT is when everybody, when anybody in IT says memory, they are not speaking of hard drive space, like how much storage you have on the computer. They are speaking specifically about RAM, the random access memory. That will be the uh, main processing component. So yes, uh, Emmanuel's got it correct. So when you're talking about hard drive space, that is called storage when you are speaking about you know, how much RAM you have, that is the memory for the computer. Does that make sense? Any questions or comments so far? All right. Outputs. It's kind of a just continuation of what we were talking about earlier. We see the NIC is there that we were talking about, the modem, drives. You know, those three were also on the input. So those would be both considered input and output devices. And then you have a monitor, printer, speakers. Those typically are output only unless the monitor is specifically notated to be a touchscreen, then it could be both. Do we have any questions on input and output devices? All right. All right, how a computer works. Um, let's see. If I have a keyboard, Amber, where would that go in this particular graph? Input. It will go with the inputs. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, Umberto, if I had a CPU chip, where would that go? Uh, processor. Processor. Got it. Christopher, if I had a monitor, where would that go? Uh, inputs and outputs. Well, monitor, not touchscreen. Oh, uh, output. Excellent. Emmanuel, if I had a DVD RW, where would that go? Either for input and output. Very good. I like it. Uh, William, if I had a ROM or a RAM, uh, card where would that go a uh, ram card um the memory ram card uh it would be input sure oh excuse me uh processing perfect perfect yes. processing all right if i had speakers ashton where would they go output output perfect if i had a nick card Kindle, where would that go? I think it would be output and input. Perfect. I like it. Okay. Um, I think here, scanner. Cliff, can you tell me where that would go? Input. Input. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Jermaine, uh, modem. Input output. Excellent. 
and Jackie, um, a storage drive, where would that go? Processor. Processing? No. Uh, storage drive, like a UPS flash drive or a hard drive. Oh, um, I would say input. Input. Okay. Last thing is output. And it could also be output. <laughs> it, well, it's, it could be both. Drives could be both. They do both input and output. So, excellent. Avery, all, uh, all in one printer. Um, it's input and output. Nice. Uh, right. okay. I don't think it can process. I could, well, it, it's input and output. That's what okay. I was looking for. Okay. It has a scanner on there so that, and then you also printing. So you, you called it. Excellent. Oh, broken through here. Kind of lays everything out. Here they actually put drives in processing, which actually they're classified into inputs and outputs. All right, quick poll. How many kilobytes are in a megabyte on your uh, Nearpod? 1,024. Hey, wait. <laughs> Calling it out, Emmanuel. We need it on the near pod. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's one thousand and twenty-four. All right, now start getting a little bit into safety and some important things to remember, especially when you're dealing with electricity, because you can either damage the components you're working on and or yourself, especially when working with electricity. So, whoop, moved a little bit too fast on that one. All right, basic electrical terminology you kind of need to be aware of when working on computers is short volt watt capacitor and transformer. So short essentially works out to be a sudden increase in the flow, can create um, heat because heat is a byproduct, byproduct of electricity. And when, a, when current flows through an unintended path, with one with rest, less resistance, a short can occur. And shorts can heavily damage components if they are not caught quickly enough and basically fry out a computer. A volt is a unit of electricity that measures the actual force of the current. And 115 is a common value, though I think in the US we we typically classify it as 110. Can anybody tell me what they classify it almost anywhere else in the world? What's the other measure they use for common household voltage? 220. Perfect, 220. So typically in the US it's 110, almost everywhere else it is 220. I am not sure about um, Puerto Rico, what standard they use, Emmanuel. Do you know off the top of your head? Is it 110 or 220? It should be the same uh, same standard as, as the US. I just wasn't sure on that particular one. But um, then you have, uh, volts are kind of tricky, especially when you start getting into static electricity. Just as little as, I believe it is 100 volts can damage or destroy a computer component. And to give you an idea of how small that is, humans can't feel anything less than close to 3,000 volts. 
So like if you, you know, shuffle your feet across the floor or the carpet and you touch the doorknob and you, and you get that little shock, static electricity, that's close to, I believe, around 3,000 volts minimum for you to feel it. And a, comp and a computer component can get damaged by significantly less than that. So you have to take great care when opening up a computer to make sure that you take the proper precautions so you don't fry your CPU or a RAM chip or something like that because that can get expensive really quickly. Uh, watt is a unit of electricity. Uh, measures the power consumption of a device, how much it needs to function. And I believe it is watts is equal to volts times amps. That's how you would get the number four watts. A uh, capacitor holds electrical charge after the power is turned off and the device is plugged in. If you look at a motherboard on top of it, it'll look like something that looks like little batteries that are welded to the top of the motherboard. Those are actually capacitors and they are storing a charge to them. So before you open up a computer, you need to be able to uh, disperse the charge of the capacitors so that you don't damage any of the components as well. And then a transformer is a device that changes the ratio of voltage to current. Does anyone know how to uh, dissipate that stored energy on a CPU when you're wanting to um, open it up and do some service? Does anybody know that process? Don't, don't say it if you do, but give me like a thumbs up, thumbs down. Give me some type of emoji if you know, but if you don't, We'll talk about it. So, Excellent. Uh, we had a couple. Man knows. Uh, Frank, you don't know. Avery, Umberto knows. Okay. Okay. Uh, out of the three, uh, Umberto, you're off mute. So go ahead and explain that process to the class. So say, for instance, you want to change. you. The goal is to replace uh, one of your RAM modules. How do you proceed, sir? Well, to, to discharge the capacitors, yeah. uh, you first unplug the, the power, and then you push the power of the computer. So all the electricity that is still in the cap capacitors will dissipate. Thank you, sir. Like I tell you, I work for Circuit City, and like Best Buy, they have the Geek Squad. We had some lane. We had a a, a com a competitor in that market. And I worked in that department. I, working on people computer, did not know that that was the process to discharge that capacitor. Of course, they would come to me already unplugged, right? And then I would do my procedural things. But um, I learned here in this class that, hey, unplug it from the wall or the UPS or however you have it plugged up. And then press the power button. And if you watch that little green light on the front, it would come back on and then go off, letting you know that all of that store uh, power on that capacitor, like Umberto said, has finally left that system. I never did that. And knock on wood, per personally, I'm glad nothing ever happened. But those are the things, that's the stuff that you unlearn in a in a controlled environment like this and relearn the right way to do things so how how fitting i was considered a computer tech and not know that so information it information varies from person to person you would think we're all on the same page but getting a certification like the a plus um pursuing the google certification those things kind of put us all on the same understanding plane. So it's good to know these things. So I'm glad Umberto already knew. I take it uh, Emmanuel probably have opened up a computer a couple in his day and Avery as well. But those type of things you learn and will be asked testing wise. So just take heed. Back to you, Kelly. All right, making sure I come off mute this time before I start talking. All right. uh, protecting yourself from shock. And the thing is, is a lot of times when you're new to working on computers and you've learned these procedures, 
you're going to be very meticulous about it. And you're going to sit there, you're going to have that checklist, like we were talking about with the, with the, you know, remember, you know, doing the alphabetical order with people's names yesterday. At the first few times you do it, it takes a long time, but you're also going to be more diligent about it because you're going to look through and be like, okay, I have my list here. What's the first thing I do? Okay, turn off the power, check. Unplug the device, check. And you're going to go through this checklist. And usually you do pretty good, you know, as a, when you're first starting to do it because you're more mindful of the steps because you don't really remember them all. So you're going to be thinking about them a lot more. The danger tends to come in a little bit later when you've been working in IT for a while. If it's your 50th computer you've opened up, you tend to get a little more lax with the uh, safety precautions sometimes, and you can just, things still plugged in. You're like, ah, oh, I just need to swap out a RAM blade. It's not going to be a big deal. Rip off the side of the computer, go in there, just yank it out, put a new one in. You know, I've done it dozens of times and never had a problem until you do. So try not to get lax in things like this. Always try to follow these safety precautions because um, I guarantee it, you know, if you get shocked, 110, is no fun, 220 burns. And so it's, you get hit by it once and you, you will remember it. So you just kind of go through these precautions. You'll hear us say it multiple times, we'll ask this question dozens of times throughout the cohort. What's the first thing you do before you open up a computer? What would be the first thing you do? Disconnect the power. Turn it off and disconnect the power. Also throw in there what Umberto was saying, press that power button for five seconds to dissipate any residual charge within the capacitors. So that's your first step it is those three things. Turn it off, disconnect it, and press the power button and hold it for five seconds to disperse the charge. Yeah, HP, yeah, I would agree with you. Emmanuel, um, let's see here. Power supplies, printers, CRT monitors contain uh, inside them a bunch of capacitors. As a tech, you will never open a power supply. Power supply comes in a contained box. You will never be asked to open that, that box to actually try to repair the physical power supply itself. That is something you will send out to an electrician or the manufacturer for them to take care of if that is something that they wanna do, but power supplies tend to be not um, overly expensive, especially for um, basic office computers. So they may not do something like that. They would typically just swap one out real quick. But inside that box power supply, there is a ton of capacitors and it is a huge safety risk because if you tap into one of those capacitors with a screwdriver it can kill you so as a big safety precaution never open up a power supply for a computer um, also when you start getting with printers especially with laser printers laser printers they also have a high voltage power supply, which is significantly more dangerous. And there are certain components on a laser printer that as a tech, unless you are specifically trained for that, you will not approach. You will either bring in an outside tech or send that part out for repair. They may just send you the part for you to swap out. Um, as it says statedly, they're considered R for FRU, which is a field replaceable unit. You don't do repair, you just swap it out. So. Just one acronym to keep in the in the back of your mind, FRU. Uh, CRT monitors. Who wants to tell me what that is? That is the cathode ray tube. It's old. Go. Yeah. Old cathode ray tubes. You got anything to add to that, Emmanuel? No, nah, he got it. He got it. Cathode ray tube. It's older, big, bulky monitors. Um, they are in such low demand that you can't even give them away nowadays. You just, you know, nobody wants them because they just take up too much space and monitors are relatively inexpensive at this point in time. It's even happening with TVs. Uh, 
I think it wasn't too long ago, I actually had like a 40 inch, it was about 10 years ago, I had a 40 inch cathode ray, it was right when the TVs were kind of working their way out and I finally saved up, bought a flat screen or whatever. And then one of my roommates was needed TV. And I was like, well, you can have this one. And they're like, well, what's the catch? And the catch was, I won't help you move it because they weigh a ton. <laughs> yeah, they're almost indestructible unless you dropped it. So yeah, CRT monitors, you will not crack open a CRT monitor because they do have a bunch of capacitors in them and, it, and they do hold a very powerful residual charge and it can be harmful to your health uh, if you don't know how to dissipate that properly. Not to mention, I believe a lot of them have mercury in them and other hazardous materials used in production. So you want to dispose of those properly as well but we will get into that in later technical sessions. All right, fire extinguishers. It seems like a kind of a nominal thing, but A plus will ask about it. Uh, the different classifications of fire extinguisher, you have class A, which tends to be, you know, the red canisters uh, with a pump on it. They're usually filled with water. Uh, something along those lines, typically used for wood, paper, other combustibles that can be easily put out with, you know, typically with water. And that would be a class A <coughs> fire extinguisher. Class B would be something used for liquids, gasoline, kerosene, oil, something along those lines. That would be like that white foam you would see sprayed out. Uh, they are not as common as they used to be. They used to be pretty common uh, probably about 10 years ago, but um, you will see, still see these from time to time. And then class C, which is typically for electrical fires and it uses a non-conductive chemical uh, to put out fires. So these would typically be what you would see in an office environment and they may even classify them as A, B, and C. But these are the ones uh, that are the most common. Uh, just quick trivia, does anybody know what uh, used to be really common in server rooms and why they stopped using it? Like for server farms, they would use them. Does anybody know off the top of their head what that might be? Class A extinguisher. No, well, A would be water, so we use, we. Would you use water in a server room with a bunch of computers? No, I misunderstood the question. My bad. <laughs> in a server room with a bunch of computers, they, they actually use a very specific type. And it is still kind of used today, but it's typically not as common. It's called halon. And it's like in the movies when you see like the gas get sprayed down. Um, in the computer rooms and stuff like that. And then you see everybody running to grab masks to put on. Uh, the very specific reason for that is that it basically dissipates all the oxygen in the room. It gets rid of it. Really great for putting out fires. Really bad if you have people working in that environment. So they found uh, more effective ways to put out the fires than using Halon, but it still is out there to some degree in some of the older server farms. So take note of these different types. They may ask you, or they likely will ask you on the A+, if you have a certain type of fire, what classification of fire extinguisher would you need to use for it? All right. We kind of got into this a little bit earlier uh, with static electricity and computer components where Components can be destroyed with 100 volts. We can't feel anything less than two to 3,000. So we actually have to use things to protect ourselves and the computers from these types of shocks so that we're not destroying computer components. And it is, tip, you know, the acronym they use for it is ESD, which just basically translates to electrical static discharge. And essentially, it can cause two different types of failure, which is catastrophic, which the component is completely destroyed and unusable. And then there is an upset failure, which is 
you didn't quite destroy it all the way, but it's not going to work to its fullest capacity because it's been heavily damaged. So when you're working on the interior of the computer, there's four different ways you can actually help protect the computer from electrical static discharge. Anybody give me an example as to what one of those would be? Let's see. Uh, manual. What would be one way to protect a computer from an ESD charge? Uh, by using an ESD safety strap. Excellent. ESD bracelet. ESD bracelets basically, um, it's like a coiled wire that'll clip around your wrist and have a, uh, a metal component that'll touch your, your skin. And then you would clip that to the interior of the computer and it would dissipate the charge or equalize the charge between you and the computer so that when you're touching the components inside, it is not going to cause a electrostatic discharge. Let's see, can anybody think of another way? So we have the wrist strap. Can anybody think of another one? Uh, yes, Avery. Um, when you take the component out, you'd want to place it on like a, an anti-static surface. Okay. Or I guess before you put it in, if you're not messing with it, you'd want to keep it on like a, I know they usually come in like, packaging that's anti-static, but there's also mats that you can get. They're called anti-static bags. So yeah, these are these components are special bags that do not allow charge uh, to be dissipated in it. Uh, Berto, do you have another one? I think that if you touch a, a metal part of the case of the computer, mm -hmm. dissipate the electrostatic discharge. That is correct, and that's why you're using that wrist strap, because that wrist strap will connect to a unpainted metal part of that computer mm -hmm. and keep the charge between you and the computer neutral so that there is no shock that'll happen. And then you have the electrostatic mat that doesn't allow the charge to pass through it. And there's two other ways um, that we can uh, prevent the computer from receiving a charge. There's an electrostatic mat that you can stand on that would dissipate the charge or you can actually have mats that you can put on the table and work on the computer from these electrostatic mats and then there are some people who actually use electrostatic gloves so there's actual gloves that you can wear by you know and use those and they would also prevent you from dispersing the charge in the computer as well you have your hand raised Humberto, or no no okay all right. Any questions with regards to electrostatic discharge here, the four components we were talking about? There's a good example right there of the electrostatic bracelet um, that you would clip on. It's something you need to make sure it's snug because if it's loose, it's not maintaining a, a good connection. You do need to make sure it's, it's snug and has a good connection with your skin so that the charge can remain the same. Uh, manual home components by the, by the corners. Yes, yes, that is a good way to not damage the components as well. All right. All right, here's some protection rules on working with components. Um, Avery, can you read number one, please? When working with someone else, touch the other person before you pass components between you. There you go. So you're gonna reach out and basically just kind of touch them in the arm, not with the one that's holding the component, but the other arm, reach out, just kind of touch them and that neutralizes the charge between you, then you can pass the component between you. Number two, Let's see, Steve, can you please read number two? Layla, can you please read number two? Store components inside anti-static bags until ready to install them. 
Absolutely. And also after you've removed them, when you take them out, typically if you're, you know, you're swapping out a ram blade in it, you would take one out, put one in, and the one you take out, put it in the in the anti-static bag that the other component came in. And that will allow you to transport it somewhere else if you need to or store it if it's still useful. Um, you may be using it in other computers and upgrading the RAM there. So any type of storage or movement of components, whenever possible, use anti-static bags. Uh, let's see. Ashton, can you please read number three? Always try to work on hardwood floors, not carpet, or use an anti-static mat. Excellent. Why not carpet? Static charge. There you go. Many of us shuffle our feet without even thinking about it, and it builds up a charge, which is almost why every single time you go into a server room, there you will. I mean, every time you go into a server room, you should never see carpet ever. It should always be concrete, laminate, something along those lines that will not. Uh, build up a static charge. Number four, uh, Will, can you please read number four? Yes, Professor. Uh, number four, when working on computers, check humidity to be sure it is not dry, which, build, which builds up elect static electricity. There you go. So not too dry. Now, does that mean you would want to have humidifiers in your in your server room running full tilt, making sure it stays very humid so it doesn't it doesn't uh, get too dry? No, then it'd be too wet. Okay, what would what would happen if we had like ninety percent humidity in our server rooms? What what are some things that can happen? It'd start like condensating. Condensation, that's a big one right there, and water and electricity, no good. They don't work good together. Um, there's another thing that can happen if you, if you let it get a little too high and it's not really building up heavy condensation, but you can actually start building up a little bit, which you won't really notice. There we go. Marvin just hit on it. Rust components can start actually rusting if you don't maintain the humidity levels within a server room. So it's kind of like the Goldilocks zone. They don't want it too, they don't want it too humid or too or too dry, you know, too dry, you get static discharge, too humid, you start getting condensation and damaging computers. So they will actually try to monitor that as much as possible. So, um, hold on one second. Um, Marvin, can you take over for just one second? I think gotcha. Victoria is calling in. Gotcha. All right, I'll be right back. So what we stop off on four. So five, Miss Kendall, would you read that one for me? Remove package and tape and in other, I'm sorry, in in and in another room as these materials attract ESD. I don't think Marvin, that was written really well, but yes, remove yeah. <laughs> package and tape in another room as these materials affect ESD. Can you take uh, over screen Marvin? Sorry, can you please take over screen share? Yeah. So I have to jump off Zoom. I got you. All right. Sorry, brother. Appreciate it. Let's see. Yes. And do you folks see my screen? Thumbs up. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and Frank, read number six for me. Tie back long hair and remove loose jewelry and clothing when handling components and reaching inside the computer. That doesn't um, affect me with the hair, but yes, we don't <laughs> we don't want to uh, have that causing any issues. It's plus, plus you, you typically would take off any um, loose jewelry as well before you start. So just kind of things that you'll do before we we dive in. And it's Almost part parts of the course. Uh, a lot of a lot of gentlemen will wear like the rubber ring when they're out in this field or when they know that they're going to be doing some services. Ways to just circumvent as much possible issues. Um, and try to think ahead and make sure that there's nothing that can cause any issues there. So, 
So those are some protection rules. Next slide, tools and necessary equipment here. So let's see. Ms. Amber, if you're available, I'm gonna let you read this one for me. Tools and necessary equipment, essential tools, demagnetized in a toolbox, a ground bracelet, ground mat, anti-static gloves, set of small screwdrivers, including Phillips and cross tip, chip extractor container with separate compartments for screws. Thank you, ma'am. Um, if you're in the field, you typically will have your tool bag. I have one. I'm trying to see where I put it. Oh. It'll show up at some point. I have one. Kelly also has a bag. But one major thing is as, as convenient as it could be, you do not want to have magnetized screwdrivers. Um, of course, you're dealing with small screws and you were like, hey, if, I just, if it's magnetized, it'll pick up the screw. I won't lose it. That's why you have something to actually grab uh, those screws out. But you don't want to have a screwdriver that's magnetized. So having that option or having that um, availability, I see how convenient it can be, but it's not something that you'll want. And it's always cool to have some tools that help you with your job. And those are some of the normal yeah pieces that you'll see so let's see thank you amber all right i got it. oh real quick i don't know marvin got into it chip extractor looks kind of like this you can see it yeah we can see it do you want to um like kind of show you um and then the there is a little thing like this has little teeth comes out it's for picking up screws Big thing on that is, is you never want to put anything magnetic inside of a computer because you can heavily damage the components. And back on the experience kind of being a working against you, a lot of times if you're working quickly and you're upgrading a chip in a computer, you'll think I'll just snatch it out with my fingers, grab the new chip, put it in there and we'll be all good rather than taking the time and using the chip extractor. A uh, quick semi-entertaining story from when I was in the cohort. We were building a VR-capable computer. It was like really nice, souped-up computer. We were going to get it, and we got to see the build from ground up and work on it together, and um, it brought all the components together, and we were working on it. And the TA for our class was uh, the one kind of leading the build. And when it came time to insert the CPU chip, which was a AMD chip, which is a pin grid array, which means it has a bunch of tiny little pins that stick out on the bottom of that, that uh, processor chip. And they are about the width of a human hair. They are very, very fine, very tiny little pins. And he was a little nervous. He was up in front of the class, you know, working with us. His hands were shaking a little bit. Didn't stop and grab his chip extractor. He went in and grabbed it with his fingers. And as he was coming into the motherboard to go ahead and put it in the computer, he dropped the chip. And it banged right off the side of the computer. So we go down and pick it up. Rather expensive chip. And look at the bottom and there's about 30 or 40 pins that were just bent. It means they weren't going to stay, would not settle into the motherboard and would not have connection. So Lucky enough, we were able to get our hands on a precision kit that had um, something a little bit like this, had little tiny tweezers, and we got a, mag you know, a magnifying glass, and we sat there for about an hour trying to straighten out these little pins so we didn't waste the CPU. And had one of those little pins broken off, it had been trash. We'd have lost the whole thing. But it literally cost us an hour to repair the pins. We were able to get it set and everything turned on and it worked perfectly well. But the moral, was, the moral of the story was had he just stopped and spent 10 seconds and grabbed his little chip extractor and actually used that to pick it up, put up, and set, none of that would have happened. 
he'd, he'd take it apart and rebuilt close to 100 computers. But that was the one time, and it actually happened to be in front of 30 other students that it happened. And, but thankfully, we were able to save it. So always nice remember to take your time. Tale. Huh? It's a nice cautionary tale. You can't get too comfortable in that scenario. Yeah. That is absolutely true. And those kits that we just showed, Kelly has a more extensive one. Um, mine probably costs less than $20. If you know that you'll be uh, in that type of environment, it's nice to have one. Also, if you ever decide to get a super inexpensive, maybe a free junk type computer, something that just turns on and off that you want to take apart. It's nice to have tools so you can get used and familiarized with how to use and be comfortable with those tools. You can add that as something that you are skilled at doing. So it's something, um, you see how I danced around that one, Kevin? <laughs> I saw how you danced around it. Yeah, it's not, okay. again, it's not a requirement. It's just something if, if, if you are very much a tactile person, and you want to, um, and this is some way, it's a way you learn better and you have a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra money you can throw at it. There's some places you can get really cheap computers to work on. They do work. They may take a little love to get them up and going. Why? But they operate. And uh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? No. Oh, all right. Um, local school board, they auction off computers all the time. These computers still work. They uh, most times still have the operating system still on them. And you can pick up a tower for about 20 bucks. It'll run Windows 10, you know, you know, and you can you can use it to test out things that you wouldn't necessarily test on your main computer. You can rip them all the way apart, pull everything out of it, put it and make sure you put it all back together to see if, you know, you're able to do that successfully and get past the post test. Um, recycle centers. We have a big recycle electronics recycle center here in Jacksonville. It's another place you can go and you can pick up a tower pretty quick. They've pretty much wiped out the memories and it's a bare bones uh, setup. You can pick it up and you can still upload your own operating systems on it, take them apart, rebuild them. And again, you could probably pick up a tower for close to 20 bucks. If it's something that you want to do, it's just a different way that you can um, kind of practice and work on these skills if you would like. So Kelly had the opportunity to um, be in person for half of his program and then virtually because of COVID. My program happened after his and it was totally um, virtual. So he had that opportunity to be in and, and work on things in person. So that's the one thing that we, we understand the program lacks, but with what I didn't need it, um, I didn't have it and I was able to do what I needed to do, but we also have test out, which you'll have soon, which gives you a close to a in-person experience as far as taking things out, putting things in, opening up that computer, doing things of that nature. And with, uh, uh, combined with what we're giving you, you, we, we try to give you as much of that experience as possible, but this is a way to supplement it. And like Kelly said, if it's possible, maybe an old, fam a mem an old member, a family member may have an old PC that they don't use, you know, just to get in there, blow it out with a can of uh, compressed air because it's probably filled, filled with dust and who knows, but you get the opportunity to pull things out, push things back in yeah. you get that, that, that feeling. So that you don't yeah. want to do with your main, like Kelly said. So just, a, uh, just the option there. Yeah, just it's just an option. And test out is about as good as you can possibly get without actually physically doing it. It's a great simulation and it works pretty well, but we should have the sign-ins for that for you guys tomorrow, hopefully. All right, any questions or comments so far on this? Next, uh, postcards, diagnostic cards, you typically don't see those very, very often, but you, you will occasionally come across texts that have them because it will give you the post code right off the bat and make it so you can look it up. And um, so small to mid-size uh, texts or companies typically won't have them, but some will have them like if you're dealing with 
uh, like Geek Squad or something like that, they may have these on hand to use them. Off times, you will just hear the beeps and then you'll look up the motherboard company and because each one kind of has their own beep codes and figure out what those beeps mean. The postcard just gives you kind of an easy way and tells you what it is. Uh, by any chance, um, let me see. Jermaine, yeah. are, you, are you able to uh, communicate? Um, what does POST stand for? <laughs> POST diagnostic is like previous. Yeah, like before, before, before you turn it on. For? I'm guessing it's saying before you turn it on or something. Like, it is before you turn it on, but that's an acronym. POST is an acronym. What does it stand for? Look at your slide. It's on there. I think that is peripheral, peripheral on a screen test. Power on self test. Power on self test. Power on self test. Yes. I almost yeah. lost over that one. Thank you, Marvin. No problem. Um, I was about to say yeah. you didn't say it, but it's there. Yeah. So yeah. Appreciate power it, on self mean. test. It's just when you first kick on a computer, it's running through and making sure it can see everything. If it's supposed to have X amount of RAM, it's checking to see if that RAM's there. It's checking to see it's got an operating system. It's checking to make sure all the components are securely connected and able to be communicated with and function to be able to get up and running. And then if it's able to do that, it moves right on past it. If it's not able to do that, like it's not able to initialize the video drivers or any of that stuff, it'll give you a series of beeps as you're turning it on. And then knowing who your motherboard manufacturer is, you would be able to go onto another computer, obviously not that one, and look up what those beeps mean. And it could point you to the issue that uh, you're experiencing. Because sometimes if you're swapping out things, you might not have seated the RAM down hard enough. And so the RAM is kind of partially sitting in there, but not fully connected. And it's not registering that RAM. And so it's failing its post test. So it's just a way for a computer to kind of tell you where the problem is if it's unable to continue the boot process. Any questions with regards to post? Hmm. All right. Now, when you start getting into networking and actually working with hardware, there's a bunch of little different tools that you will come across. Yes, they do ask about a lot of these on the um, A plus exam. There is a nice little quick list of them ahead of time, which the first one on that list is the crimper. Looks like this, if you can see it. We can see it. You can see it? Okay. And it's basically if you're putting together either RJ11 or RJ45 cables, which is your, you know, your phone cable or Ethernet cable, when you're putting the ends on it, you use these crimpers to be able to crimp, crimp that plastic piece, that plastic end right onto the unit so that once you get all those tiny little wires fed in there, um, you get a solid connection and then you're able to hopefully able to utilize it. And built into it is typically a cable stripper about halfway down. There's a razor blade, if you can see it, and they would be able to cut or strip wires. Otherwise, they would have a standalone unit. Uh, virtual background looks like this. Uh, and it allow you to strip the different cables so that you can get into and start working on them. If you're working on the interior of a computer, you want to see if there's actually a charge getting to the components or if you know is the problem in the power supply or is the problem in the component you can use a multimeter where you're able to check for continuity and or the voltage or charge going through the lines um, these are some things that you can pick up pretty inexpensively as you go i highly suggest if you're going to get into it buy an inexpensive set first see if it's something you actually like doing you like working with and then if you do like it and you're using them rather frequently, then start upgrading to a more expensive kit. Um, another piece they have on here is called a tone generator and probe. The other term you will hear used for this is called fox and hound. Um, electricians will use it as well as network engineers. It looks like this. There is the tone generator which is a little box and it will plug into the port or you will plug the wire into the end of it and it will send a tone across the line. 
like a audible tone that you can that can be heard. And then you will use this probe on the other side to find out which wire is generating that tone. So if you're going into a server room and there's a thousand wires being plugged into various switches and you're trying to figure out which one is connected to the port that you're working on, then you want to be able to quickly and easily do this. You use a tone generator and then you can go into the server room and find out which one is the correct cable. It saves you a lot of time, especially if the um, person who set up the server room prior to getting there did not label them correctly, did not say, you know, this is port A1 and then on the actual port in the wall next to where the computer is. Also mark that one A1 so that you can marry up those two. This is a way that you can do that after the fact if it hasn't been done prior. Um, another really great one, if you are making cables, if you are you know, making your own cables for the office, a lot of times they just buy the cables, but larger companies, if they wanna save money, will actually go ahead and make the cables themselves. They will use something called a cable tester. It looks like this is on there. And basically what it is, is it's two pieces that are connected and then in one end, you will plug in one part of the cable. In the other, you'll plug in the other. And then along the front, there will be a series of lights that will correspond with the individual wires that are going in. And it will tell you if there's connectivity between those two uh, wires or tell you if there is a bad connection. Like if there's an open or a short somewhere along that line, it'll be a bad connection. You'll know the cable's bad because I can't tell you how often where you think it's a software issue or you know the internet servers are down or something like that. And it's just a bad cable. And so oftentimes you can swap out that cable to make sure it's, it's okay and test out a different cable. But um, in the lines in the walls, they're called horizontals. Those often, those sometimes can go bad. It's extremely rare, but it does happen and a cable te tester is a good way to do that. And these actually have a range of something like 100 meters. So they work pretty good and you can get them really, really inexpensively if you want to you know, test it out, see if it's something that you like. Um, another tool that you see, well, they're actually kind of going out of style, people don't use them much, is a loopback plug, which basically just sends the signal right back into the computer as it's coming out through the uh, the NIC card, it sends that signal right back in. Basically what it does is it's telling you if the NIC card is actually working. So they call it a loop back. They make little adapters like this. And essentially you would plug that into the back of the computer. And if you see the light blinking on the NIC card, you know your NIC card is actually working. So it's not the actual physical hardware. So you can move on to the next component. It's just something that you can use to test to see if the uh, component itself is working. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Yeah, I, I, I just have a question. Uh, I just need to know about uh, just UFI and the BIOS. What, what is the difference between these two? Uh, we will actually get into that a little bit later, but essentially BIOS is an older version. UFI, UEFI is the more recent version of the same thing. Uh, we'll get into that in a little more detail um, in a couple more technical sessions down the road. But don't worry about yeah, that. Got a whole got a whole layout for you, Mogan. So you'll be well, well, well breast on that. So okay, thank you. And when you're um oh, lost my screen. Two seconds. There we go. Uh the other thing is a punch down tool. Looks kind of like this got like a little fork in it and one side of it actually has a blade and the other side is curved and this tool is used when you're creating what's called they call them 110 blocks or the receivers behind the wall plates where you would plug your cables into they'll have a little plastic piece that you have to push down each individual wire in the cable like your ethernet cable and so that it has a solid connection. But what the punch down tool does on one end, it will push it down and the other end, it'll clip off the other excess cables. So it 
doesn't get in the way later, just snips it off. And it's just called a punch down tool. So that's another one you'll need to be aware of. Wi-Fi analyzer, I have not, I do not have one of those physically, uh, but those are basically used to determine what Wi-Fi signals are being transmitted in your area. So you know what channels they're operating off of, are there any Wi-Fi channels being used and things like that. Um, those can be used by text. They can also be used by people for ill-gotten gains if they're looking for Wi-Fi networks to connect to, to hack into. So any questions so far with basic tools for networking and or tech, IT support? Yep, Wi-Fi man. Uh, yeah. All right, we got about just a few more minutes, and then we will be breaking for lunch. What's going? Yes. Uh, can Can you just basically just tell me again, punch down tool? Uh, I know you demonstrated the the device, but can you tell me again what does it do, so I can write it? Uh, the there? punch down tool is like where you would have the actual receiver, where you would plug the Ethernet cable into, like you know, behind the plate in the wall, that little port that you plug into. You would use the punch down tool to connect the wires to that port. And then it will clip off the excess while you're doing it. It kind of pushes it in. There is um, a really good, really good pictures in your book that kind of show you what it's doing. And then I believe on YouTube, Mike Myers has a video where he demonstrates a punch down tool really well. If I can find that, I'll throw that in our Slack, the group Slack channel. So you can kind of see it being used and it makes a little more sense. Um, but basically it's just, Kind of being able to identify them by sight and what their purpose is, is what you'll need to do for the A+. But as you work in IT, you will eventually become a little more familiar with them if you're working with hardware to any capacity. Got it. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> no problem. No problem. Any questions so far? All right. That's good. All right, I think we are close to the end here. Um, by now, should be able to describe in a very basic sense how computers work. You take in information, process it, and then you know send it out through an output. Uh, understand the difference between hardware, software, and firmware, and explain the key safety precautions. To, uh, to take as well as the tools, basic understanding of the tools that you use in the profession and how to protect yourself and the computer. Let's see, can someone give me a really quick basic rundown? Let's say, Chris, can you give me a quick basic rundown of the difference between hardware, software, and firmware? Um, hardware is basically the computer, the monitor, the things you can physically touch. The software is like the inner, the program that's inside the computer, like Microsoft, and the applications also that's with the, uh, the program. And firmware would be like the, the RAM, the ROM, I think there I got that go. right. Okay, ROM. yeah. Yeah, the ROM and so I'm tip my tongue. Oh. <laughs> and the the motherboard, like the chips on the motherboard stuff. Oh, like the that. BIOS. BIOS. Yeah, the BIOS. You were right, you were right there. You had it. But <laughs> all in all, great explanation. I do love it. I do love it. Um, let's see here, uh, Avery. Can you tell me what a class A fire extinguisher? would be used for uh class a is for like wood fires wood fires yeah okay um amber can you tell me what a class c does class c uses what is it a non-conductive liquid to put out electrical fires will be a gas but other than that, actually a perfect definition. I love right, not it. a liquid. Yeah, not a liquid. Um, it would be a gas. 
like a powder or mm -hmm. gas along those lines. All right, uh, Frank, can you tell me what this is? Uh, I don't see anything. I see the question. Hold on, let me stop here. Or uh, Marvin, can you stop sharing? Here we go. Can you tell me what this is? Oh, a crimper. There you go. All right, uh, Jermaine, what is this? That was a tone, the tone reader. Close. It's, I've worked with it before. It's, um, I can't remember the name for it, but it just reads the tones of the line. Nope, that's, no. that would be this. Oh. You can really yes, see it. That would be the toner and probe. That's the tone generator. Okay, that's tone generator. What is that? Don't know. Breaks apart. Anybody want to help out? Is there a loop okay, back we'll just, uh, Everybody spoke one time. What do we got? Cable martel. Cable tester. Perfect. Cable tester. Cable yeah. tester. So. It's only the second time we're seeing these, so I'm not I'm not expecting it to be perfect. Who can tell me what this is? Chips extractor. Chips Chip extractor. There we go. And lastly, cannot see. <laughs> A USB? Nope, not a USB. What's that? Is it the Nick tester? <laughs> What's the term for that? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, a back loop. Loop back yeah. plug. Excellent. Loop back. Great. Amber and Umberto. Perfect. I like it. So, just basically, you know, you'll become more familiar with them over time. This would be the toner probe and the tone generator. But um, also this one actually works as a um, cable tester as well, which is a nice little combo. Um, but just on site, understanding the basic uses for them, what they're for, and um, being able to recognize them when you see them would be key for the test. And then you'll kind of start using them a little bit more as you get into the profession. Uh, can anybody tell me what's the first thing you do before you open up a computer? Uh, you take off, you make sure it's completely power, it's completely okay. off of it, so you unplug it, and then you press the power button. How long? Until they see the green light comes on and then goes off. Was it Amber? Five seconds. five seconds. Five seconds. Which would be about five That's seconds. good. I like it. That's yeah. good. That's really good. <laughs> um, what are the four different ways we can use to protect a computer? from an ESD charge. Somebody give me one. Give me just one of them at a time. What's the first one? ESD bracelet. Uh, ESD bracelet. There you go. There's one. Who wants to give a second one? The rubber uh, mat. The what? Rubber mat. Stand on uh, the rubber mat. There you go. That's two. Gloves. Gloves. That's three. I need, I need a rubber ring instead of a jewelry. I don't know if that works. Not right. That has nothing to do with that. No. <laughs> Not that one. ACD mat. Well, we already got the we already mat. got the mat. Th think about transporting components. The anti-static bag. There you go. Anti-static bags. It's number four right there. So basically a lot over it. It's mostly just getting you guys familiar with the terminology, like some basic terminologies. Um, 